there's people in the Marines that are that are artists, that are ex sports people that have they've done all weird and wonderful things and go on to do all weird and wonderful thing, things after. Because I think if I thought if they find this, they're hundred percent going to rip it up. The stereotype is is that everybody thinks that you're just this mindless killer. Mainly the Americans would, would leave. And all we did for that year was reassure them that it wouldn't happen. Hello, friends, and a wonderfully good evening to you all. Um, I'm Chris Rule. I'm a former Royal Marines commando and now proud host of the Bought the T-Shirt podcast and is my app utmost delight to welcome fellow marine fellow author fellow um what can you say life smasher gareth timmins back to the show gareth how are you brother i'm very well thanks mate it's uh, it's a pleasure to be back mate it really is uh yeah it's great how are you doing yeah i'm all right i'm i'm busy um rallying the veterans because uh the time is now fellas i think some of you understand what i'm saying but we'll we'll maybe talk more about that in a bit gareth um for our friends at home gareth's written this wonderful book oh there we go look not just becoming the one percent but becoming the 0.1 percent and that is the statistic for the number of people that want to join the Marines and go to the recruiting office and the actual number, so one in a thousand, that get awarded the green, the green berry. Um, so how's book sales going, mate? Yeah, it's going really well. It's just, I mean, how it's been received has been absolutely incredible. I've just been, just been blown away. I mean, writing, starting to write, a few, well, four or five years ago now and just... You know yourself being a being a fellow author, mate. Is when you you get like writer's anxiety and amnesia, where you you don't know whether it's going to be received well or whether it's going to be good or what you're writing is actually good. And and then all of a sudden, fast forward, and it's it's just it's just doing incredibly well and just being received not only by the military but military personnel, but just by by everybody day to day, men and women. So it's just it's just been incredible, mate. Absolutely incredible. Yeah, well deserved, mate, isn't it? Well deserved. It's um, life is funny. You know, what? God, I'm gonna sound not to sound critical here, mate, but it's when people go, "Oh yeah, I'm thinking about writing a book." You just know immediately from that sentence that book is never gonna be written, right? Because you don't think, <laughs> you don't think about right. You you either write it or you or it doesn't happen. Um, yeah, sure. And it's that journey, isn't it? You put pen to paper and lo and behold, whatever it is, a year later, in my case, by the time I finished editing, it was about two years later. And there you are. You've got a publishing deal. You're a published author. It's an incredible achievement, but it's, you know, one, one step at a time, isn't it? It is, mate. It's, it's, it's a strange one because I've, I've kind of, I've started putting a bit of pen to paper now for something that I'm potentially working on. And it's almost like when you start it, you just, you don't know if, if you're just wasting your time. It's a real, really, it's a real strange one. And it's exactly how I felt when I was writing this up. I, I, I did the diary entries, but then I just, I didn't really know where to go with it after that. And it's just, you, you never know whether, what you've got no guarantees. And I think that's the biggest gamble of it. You've just got no guarantees that it's going to get published and that it's going to get received well. So you're very much, uh, I suppose, in a sense, it's a very uh, therapeutic kind of way of of, of expression and, and, and creativity. What I found recently, mate, is, is that I write when things aren't particularly great or when I'm in adversity. Like I wrote the diary in training. I wrote this when I was going for a really difficult uh kind of renovation and they're separated with me with my long-term partner so mm -hmm. it's just uh it, it's a it's a it's strange how it kind of emerges really yes it's one of those things in life 
where you just got to get stuck in and go for it. Um, I, I will be honest, when you're writing non-fiction, it, it does help if you've got a story there, doesn't it? Like you had your marine story because you had the backbones of it written through your diary that you kept. I had my story and I was thinking, on that, people always ask me about my memoir. They say, was it therapeutic? I'm like, what? Writing about when you absolutely lost the plot 20 years ago and nearly died several times. I, I was, it, it's all memories you, you should... No, I didn't write my book for any of that stuff. I wrote it because I wanted to make a name for myself. Yeah. You know, I was that um, ego driven back then, 2008, that I wanted my five minutes of fame. So I wasn't going to mm. make it as the lead singer of Oasis because they already had one. Is that what you wanted, though, mate? Oh, massively. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to be adored by, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of screaming fans. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was, it's, 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 we could go down a, a bit of a rabbit hole here, but, you know, this all ties in with damaged childhood, trying to prove yourself as a Marine, um, finding yourself through substance use, but, but being that damaged, you just take it way too far. Un, unintentionally, you don't have any control over that. Once it's got you, you just got to ride that, baby out and some people yeah. you know some people don't make it sadly yeah yeah absolutely um, but through the journey and because i did make it and there was one time mate yeah i i used to go down the oh, our local pub guys the roughest pub in my city right people feared to go in there i, I loved it <laughs> I used to go in there was a bong on the bar anything you wanted either that guy there could get it for you or that guy there could get it for you and and um used to go in there and always on the jukebox it was the verb or oasis and these guys were just you know it, it for me back then they were just living a dream you know snorting yeah them. yeah yeah they snorting stuff for breakfast and then going out and, and yeah, I wanted it. Oh, you know, this is this is damaged psyche. I wanted in. I thought, but anyway. Mm. So I'm talking a lot, but the thing is that that's why I wrote my book. I wanted mm. I wanted my fame. <laughs> and, yeah, uh, I'll be honest. I am quite glad that I I got a bit of it. Um, mm. It's led me on to just have a dream lifestyle, but now on full circle it's nothing to do with having any kind of public profile that's it's it I, you know i'm so level-headed now if i woke up tomorrow and all, all my books have been taken off the shelf and my youtube channel had been deep i would i i just smile and go for breakfast with my family <laughs> yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so do you person. do you think you're right again Oh mate, I love to. I love writing every day. Mm. It's only that this YouTube journey just took me left field for bloody ages, and I'm and just as I was coming back in again, and I was going to start doing my audio books. This um, I'm just going to call it. This nonsense came upon us. People will either understand what I'm talking about or they won't, and of course. I'm now looking at a future for my son of sl complete slavery. You know, mm. I, I, I've been lucky. So have you. We've travelled the planet. We, you know, I've been every country I ever wanted to go, and I've done everything I ever wanted to do, and nobody stopped me. Now, my son won't ever be able to travel. He won't ever be able to go in a nightclub. This is almost like ninety nine point nine percent certain. Um. Now, he won't be allowed to do anything unless he kowtows to a bullying corporate agenda that's not not in anybody's interest anyway, right? So, just as I thought I was going to get back to the writing, I've had to rally the veterans to come and sort this shit out, you know? Um, 
which I don't mind doing because you get one life. You can either live as a legend or you can just be a gutless coward. And believe me, there's plenty of gutless cowards out there that are just going along with this because it makes their life easier. I'm not talking mm -hmm. about the people that don't understand what's going on. That's not that's not their fault. I mean the ones that know what's going on, but they're just like, oh, I'll just, I'll just turn a blind eye. So, you know, that was to answer... Um, answer your question um so yeah you know writing i wanted my five minutes of fame did was that an issue for you or did you just want to see your book come to fruition Th uh, fruition really mate i i when i started writing the diary uh it was it was never my intention whatsoever to uh to write a book i just I, I got asked on a recent podcast like what are the what's the two things that you you never thought that you would do as a young as a young as a young boy and one of them is write the book and the second is go to university i just it would just i never could have predicted that at all but uh there were two things i, I felt like i had a, uh, an obligation to get the contents out there because i was so sick and tired of seeing the documentaries that were getting churned out from Limston that were just really watered down uh, and, and and didn't accur accurately represent what life was like at Limston. And I just felt that my book did that. So I just started writing, mate, and just, uh, and I think I, I had I had uh, full belief in, in, in what I'd got. Uh, and then obviously met my agent and he just said, you need to add in the lessons and, I just finished university, so the lessons, the psychological lessons, just lended itself to to the book, and I just pulled out a theme, and uh, and here we are. So it's just, in a sense, it's just been the perfect storm, mate. Yeah, those documentaries are designed to make it look like it's softy, softy for wimps, isn't it? So that because they're desperate for recruitment now, like I mean. Like cracking the ice on Peter's pool on a February morning when it's minus, like Gemma. you know, it's minus bloody six. You got to get straight in that water with all, <laughs> all that equipment on without, and you don't think about it. They don't, hmm. you know, it's hard to capture that, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really is hard to capture that. And I think if they did capture it, they'd be, they'd be uproar. But the, the reality of it is just, I just wish that they'd somebody would have had the courage just to film it how it is because people want to see that. Like you said, it's like on our endurance course on one of the run throughs, or it might even have been on the day. The two people at the front on the, on the, on the speed match up had to break the ice with a sledgehammer. Yeah. Uh, ready for us to go through it. Uh, so, so yeah, I just felt like uh, there were a story to be told is, is exactly that. The fame and the, and if there is any, uh, fortune incoming uh, is just a byproduct, really, mate. It was just more of a. I just felt I had to do it. It was just uh, I was getting drawn to it. It wasn't uh, really a choice, as from what I can recall. Yes, um, it's. I, I, people when they read my stuff that I write about Limston or whatever, or, or when I do my podcasts on on my time in. They're amazed that I can remember it. I didn't. I never wrote it, but I just remember it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I just. I, I mean, I remember all. I remember rocking up in induction. We're talking bloody. My God, I can't. I can't even do them. But thirty-five years ago now. Mate, I tell you what, you must have had training hard then. Oh, mate, when I went through, <laughs> it was the hardest in the world it was actually mm. quite well known that it was harder for my troop than it actually is for the SAS <laughs> and the SBS combined like I mean the SAS do the SAS selection then do SBS right out oh it's the same thing now that doesn't work does it um yeah but, but yeah. I know what you're saying I know what you're saying mate but no, we all like to say that, but it, it, it certainly was harder back then because we didn't have this four weeks that they've got now to prepare. Mm. You know, you go, the, 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 there's lots of stuff. They're saying that these kids' bodies, I don't mean kids disrespectfully, I, you know, but we was teenagers mm. when we rocked up there, weren't we? 
Yeah. Um, you, you're a bit older than me, I remember you saying, but they're, they're saying, aren't they, that they're because they're just doing the Xbox all day and not throwing themselves out of trees and building dens like we did as a kid, their bodies are not formed like yeah. as as men. So yeah. they've got these kind of... That, that's the reason, mate, why they've brought in the ROP, the four weeks, the recruit orientation phase, because... Uh, people's skeletal structure, especially lower limbs, are not uh, conditioned enough to take the impact. And as a result, they're getting a lot of stress fractures early in training. So the I think they've been looking at vitamin D supplementation to, uh, to try and see if that works. They're trialing that or they have trialed that. But yeah, it just, it, I mean, that is a vivid kind of representation of, 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 of the, the difference in generation and where we currently stand now. Uh, and I mean, I went through in 2005 and it was massively different to what it is now. Uh, we, we lived differently I, as a child in, in the 80s and 90s. Like you said, uh, jumping out of trees and jumping over people's fences and playing tigs and all that. It's, you don't really see that anymore. Uh, I know times have changed. Do you know why it's great? Is if if I quite often forget to lock the garden shed now or lock the front door, you don't have to worry about it. No, no one's tough enough to go and rob your house. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's um, it, but it is a thing, you know. It used to be if you left your car door open for one night, that's your stereo gone. Yeah, um, bit different now because the stereos are, are all anti theft sophisticated. But mate, before we go any further, can I open my present? You can indeed, mate. Yes, absolutely. So, friends at home, look what I got. All wonderfully packaged. Look, 0.1. Um, one. 0.1. Sorry, I have to think then. Beautiful little postcard in there. I haven't got my glasses, but um, mission statement. A brand that invites you to be better, to strive for higher. Level, to high, to strive for higher levels of performance and capability to reach your true percent potential www.0.1.co.uk look at that dun, dun, dun. and inside mate this is like the best wrapping i think i've ever ever I've, it's, it's like going to harrods or something <laughs> I've got the seal. I've got the official seal. Yeah, mate, I'm delighted about that. It looks fantastic, yeah. Oh, mate, it's awesome. It's awesome. Let's get it open. I, I, I don't want to rip it, but I guess I might have... Or maybe I just slide it out sideways. How about that? And then after you've done that, I think you should keep it in that forever. Well, every time I put yeah. it away, I have to put it back in here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> glo gl look, globe and laurel size, everybody. For all our civilian friends out there, or uh, we've got Paddy in the chat. Paddy's uh, our para brother. Um, everything at Limston has to be magazine size. That's why we call it Globe and Laurel, our magazine, the Globe and Laurel. Everything has to be this size in your locker. You try getting a pair of socks to that size, I tell you, it's not easy. Oh, mate, look at that. Oh, that is legendary. Look at on the back. Destroy boundaries. On the front. 0.1. Oh, mate, that is so kind of you, Gareth. No I'm, problem, I'm mate. Pleasure. Really, really appreciate it. That means I don't have to go shopping for another year, possibly two. Um, <laughs> I know that you're mega into like sustainability in the planet, mate. So that's what I kind of thought when I sent it. I just thought that you could, you you, you wear that there's a year in that easy. Oh, mate, you're a legend. Absolutely. I tell you what, I never thought I'd get so many T-shirts sent to me since I started the podcast. And it's brilliant. People yeah. are so kind, you know. Um, people are so kind. So, yes, where were we talking about the horrors of Limpton? Let's um get some... Let's get some questions from the chat. So there's some questions in there, aren't there? 
we'll ignore some of them that what's that chris how come you're so handsome uh, just born like it mate born like it um oh gareth, i'm here mate someone's trying to call gareth um uh, the, the, luke saying bought the t-shirt on that one chris don't we all luke that's luke our producer um da, 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 da. how do you know where to start from jules yeah. i think that that is uh for the book I, I i believe yeah you say your way and i'll say how i did mine yeah so what i did for, for mine really was uh and this is how i've kind of started future writing projects is I just write down sections that I want to discuss uh, in chronological chronological order. Uh, and I basically, I write the main body first, uh, as in the main section of the book. Uh, and then I allow the main section of the book to inform, obviously, the conclusion, but also the introduction. And now I'm going to start it. So I just basically, uh, with training, with with a diary, I got in the 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 main meat of the diary entries, uh, and then worked out a way of our then linked it all together, both from the start and from the end, really. Yeah, you had it all. You 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 were on a winner there because you had all the structure. So I'll just see if I can get you this up. Um, because for anyone out there who wants to write. A book. Oh, this is ah. Oh. oh, how how uh, bizarre. Oh, there it is. I thought they'd taken one of my books off Amazon. Then, um, this is just a real. Yeah, hang on. Let me just show people at home this one second. Yeah. So this. This book here, folks. How to write a memoir. I just put this together for anybody out there that wants to write and in it is just everything that I had to learn to write my first book and get it published and it's mm. concise so you're not going to get a big thick book that by the time you get to the end is just too much to, it's really simple writing it, it um it's a process and you get better as you go along it and your skills improve by going through the process, not by like reading huge, great books on how to be good at writing. So, um, yeah. So it's there. So exactly that. I think the, the greatest advice I could give anybody is just write concisely, which yeah. you've just touched upon, mate. Yeah. And that book tends to be free guys on Kindle. So you can read it on your phone, download Kindle to your phone and read it and whatever. But in my book, because I was writing about something that happened 15 years ago, or it's 15 years ago when I wrote the book, I just bomb burst all my memories, basically what happened in Hong Kong and leaving the Marines. I wrote, just wrote pages, of every memory. Little, little old Chinese man said this, guy in the nightclub said this, I said that, this happened there, so-and-so on the bus, go into the nightclub meeting Brandon Block, da, 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 mm. da, you know, just, just, and then I went through it and thought, right, that happened after that, swap that, and I ended up with roughly, this said about 12 chapters, mm. and I just picked the first memory, and I wrote it, and I picked the next one, I wrote that as my next, and I did all the stuff, put the reader in the scene, you know, address the sights the sounds all this sort of stuff really just all you got to do is put the reader in your shoes so they're enjoying a ride and that's your job done right yeah and as i went through that process just come up with loads more memories and those 12 pages went to about 24 and some stuff i wrote about and then i just deleted it but i thought that's but yeah anyway sorry i just wanted to shout my book there because it's um anyone who's thinking of writing it's all in there let's go to another question absolutely are you going to do the uh, andy mcnab chris ryan road <clears throat> i guess they're talking about the fiction not not joining the yeah. FAS. yeah the non-fiction side of it uh 
I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's if it's kind of me really. I like. I'm a great fan of like gritty documentaries, and it's kind of how I want to write. I want to write real life. Uh, kind of no kind of fluffing it up, but just real to life accounts of of whatever of the Marines of mental health of mindset and just kind of be really, really honest with it and tell it how it is. So I'm not sure whether the Andy McNabb and the Chris Ryan road kind of lends itself to, to, to where I want to go maybe in future, but at the minute I just want to do like real life accounts that people can really, that resonate with people from all different walks of life and that will help. Uh, I think is, is, is definitely where I find my most fulfillment with, with writing. Yeah. Do you have any ideas of what you might come up with? So I've always really suffered with OCD uh, as a child. And it always really, really kind of, in a sense, was a force for good. It was the the, the perfectionist side of OCD as a, as a child growing up, which really, really helped in, in rugby and, and preparing and getting into the Marines and, and writing a diary. But then when I went into like kind of hostile environments, it started going really negative uh, as in with the checking and the ruminating thoughts and stuff. And I'm still battling with that today. Uh, and I just thought that I'd, I'd kind of do something where we discuss that, but also discuss success. And now sometimes the byproduct of, uh, of success is, is, is mental illness. Yes. I guess you can never write enough about that, can you? No, so that's just one kind of angle, just using, just talking in a sense about my mind and, and just how it functions and how it allows me to be creative and, and, and go out there and, in a sense, achieve what I want to do, but also the downside of it. Uh, I suppose the, down, the downside of, of what you could consider to be a successful mindset, and that is that often we don't really pay attention to how we're actually feeling we're constantly on this path of trying to achieve when when you're not really you're not really taking stock of of where you are mentally guys so true mate you know it it's a funny old life isn't it because probably like you said i mean we wouldn't have achieved some of the things we hadn't unless we were obsessive that's the thing that is it yeah, but the downside of being obsessive in what you want to do is, is it has massive, uh, there's massive fallout from it. There is negatives that you have to contend with. As soon as you take your, your foot off the, uh, off the success kind of path, you start encountering problems and that's kind of what I've, what I've had to contend with throughout really. But yeah, that and, and just basically... Help. So how does that affect you then, Gareth? Do you get, I mean, do you get anxiety or stress or depressed or, or what, what? I don't really, get, I don't get depressed, mate, but I get, uh, sometimes I get bad anxiety uh, as a result of OCD. Uh, it's all kind of OCD led where I sometimes feel like I can't relax unless I've checked certain things and it's all irrational stuff. Uh it could be making sure the tap's off. And I know it sounds stupid, but, and I say this because I just hope it helps other people uh, that I think there's like we've discussed before, the stereotype of, of, of people like us is, is that you're so mentally strong that you, but it's, it's just not the case. We, we are mentally strong people, but uh, we're human beings at the end of the day and, and we have to manage our emotions and, and sometimes it just spills over. Yes, we're mentally strong at certain things. I like to think I'm a good all rounder now because I've just put so much effort into it all. And and mm. if you can wake up happy and go to bed happy and never let, pretty much never let anything get you down, or, or when it starts, you can recognise that and, and take yeah. action. Then I think jobs are good. Mate, at, you know, if, if you're in a fantastic place, if you're there. Uh... Absolutely. And I'm not saying I'm not there. Uh, I'm just saying that things could be better. What I have found, Chris, in recent years, especially I think on publishing the book, is that 
I always thought success brought fulfillment. And and it definitely doesn't. It is what I've what I've learned. Uh and I'm really, really starting to look at that as I'm approaching 40 now and getting a bit older that if I want to fulfillment, I can't keep chasing success because I don't think it's going to be at the end of it. Uh, I'm not saying I'm not going to continue to do so, but you, you, you're constantly chasing these things in life to bring you happiness and they don't. Yeah, there's a massive thing there, isn't there? You, you, you've got to just sit back, chill the hell out and realise you're in paradise now. Don't keep thinking it's next week with this. That's a definite thing. That's but, exactly it. But but what I did is when I had my book published, to me, that was the cherry on the cake of life. Simply because you... You know, I was a bit, my mindset was so different then. I, You know, I had friends that were earning thousands a week. I had friends that were, you know, just what, you know, dating like the top news readers from the BBC, you know, married to them, all this kind of stuff. And, and it, when you're there and you're sticking needles in your arm 12 times a day and, and you're living in squalor and you've lost all yourself... You, you, all that stuff seems so and you take a load of shit when you've got mental health problems you know you get you just get treated like fucking dirt by society right yeah so for me it was just this thing that I travelled a lot I'd done so much in my life but I'd never achieved like vocationally I wasn't like, mm. good at anything. And so yeah. when I got my book published, that for me was index. Job done. That is on. You know that, that funny uh, REF video, the uh, five mile of death? <laughs> right, fellas. <laughs> Hang on, this is Scouse accent, isn't it? You can t stand toe to toe in the bar with the Paris and Marines. <laughs> right, right that, <laughs> that one. Right. For me, it was like, I can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe the bar with any fucker. I'm a best-selling author. What What are you? Oh, oh, you're a, you're a salesman. You're an hundred grand a year. Okay. I, that's how my... My mind wasn't like that, but other people's were. Yeah. I wanted to be able to meet that. And what I realise now is I didn't need any of that shit. I just... All you need to do is smile and be yourself in life. And who gives a fuck about all of that bollocks you know yeah it's it's a it's a strange kind of realization mate and i think i'm probably heading there myself uh but it's you like chase all these materialistic things and titles uh and i'm not saying i don't like them and i don't like the achievement of it uh and but for me i almost relish the journey more than the actual thing of getting it i mean the book has has completely in a sense, flip that on its head because I'm still blown away by by it, by it really, and, and and getting it to publication. But I just think that we spend so much time projecting into the future uh, and wanting these things and wanting this idyllic life, and we don't look at what we've got now. And that's something that I really, really try and, and really focus my time on now, especially with my boy. I mean, there's been times when we've been walking in the Peak District. We go there quite a lot. And sometimes we just sit down and uh, on a on the top of a tour and we just have a, a simple picnic. And it's I just, I just kind of self-reflect and think, you know what? I don't need anything else other than just to be sat here with him. That's all I need. Mm. Uh, and, and I think that is, if I could bottle that, and have a bit more of that in my life, uh, that kind of feeling of, of not just, I'm happy here, and I don't need anything else. I think I, that's that's where it's at. Yes. When, I mean, I'm I'm exactly the same boat. I mean, we're, we're both in the same boat in that respect, and it, and it works with myself as well. Now, sometimes I just walk away from this freaking computer. I've spent, I spent thousands upon thousands of hours in front of this this screen that screen that screen i've done this now mm. for uh, for 14 years 
you know and now i just say fuck it i'll go and put the telly on and i'll watch a documentary <laughs> and i just i love to be able to just do that say it doesn't yeah it doesn't matter and mm-hmm. then when my you know kid comes home from school i try to like be there for him or at least do we go down the park at least do something mm-hmm. but isn't it mad mm-hmm. how that 80s you know time is money culture meant people would put their kids with a nanny so that they could go to work more yeah that mate it's fucked up it's uh i mean the, the most precious thing that you've got is 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 spending time with your kids and and, and watching them grow and 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 my little boy is nearly seven now and i just he is literally my life i just love spending time with him he's difficult he's tough uh it comes with his problems but uh I, i'm at my happiest when 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 i'm when i'm with him it's 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 just fantastic and to think that you would offset that responsibility to somebody else that's not even blood related is is pretty crazy really i think i think a society i think we just the, the world's socially constructed in a way that is uh completely detrimental in some respects to to our mental health and it's it's just getting worse oh massively um i can make decisions now quite ruthless ones because if the universe is telling me the people in my life are stressing me out then they can fuck off Mm. i just i can cut them out absolutely i don't i'm not talking about being nasty or anything here i just mean i just mean that you know i meet so many people now on a daily weekly basis and everybody wants a piece of me you know I'm not, I'm not, I absolutely, this is not a complaint. I'm just saying how it is, right? And I mm. try to be there for, for everybody. Get lots of emails saying, Chris, um, my number's here, mate. You can just pick up the phone so we can have a chat. And and it's like people see you on YouTube for two hours a week. They think that's all you do, you know, two yeah. hours. Yeah. And the rest of the time you sit chatting. To, it's like, I can't even phone the people I love. <laughs> well, I can, but. You know, yeah. if I had that time, I'd spend it with my son. Um, yeah. But recently I realised that certain situations, would they were lower in my vibration. Mm. The people weren't right. And there's nothing wrong with them. They just, it wasn't. And I had to walk away. I just had to say, right, sorry, my son, my son comes first. Absolutely. Mm. He can't. He can't have a stressed out dad because when I get mm. stressed, I can get shouty and that's just unacceptable. You know? Yeah. It's just unacceptable around a child. And have you not, have you found that Gareth, that being a father has really made you brush your skills up? Absolutely. I mean, I, uh, it, it's just, it's just the greatest kind of responsibility that you can have. And I know it's, it's often, quite a, a cliche word really but it, this the, the weirdest part about becoming a father was is that i were always uh i were a certain type of person that i think you've got to be to go in the marines and i think you can probably attest to this mate and a lot of people can and when 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 then when we knew we were having my little boy i wondered what kind of dad i would be and whether whether i would love him like I wanted to because I didn't feel like I had that in me but as soon as he were born I just he was just my absolutely everything and uh and yeah just just absolutely relish every every moment we get together it's mad and it's mad it's mad how it changes you mate because I uh I was very much like I always thought that I'd be like going out and 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 being overseas in the Middle East and stuff and working like that and always I think chasing the buzz of in a sense being in hostile environments but as soon as I had him I just lost there were a piece of me that I just lost I just lost the edge that you need to do that and uh, just thank God I did this is the selfishness of service personnel I, I would say particularly men although I don't know this but is they literally will just go into a war zone with no thought. Well, 
apparently very little thought that like you're a father with three fucking kids yeah and yeah you know one of my best mates from the marines got he got he did private security he got shot dead in um got taken out big time in in iraq mm. and he had oh it's horrible to think of he had a little boy must have been about two Mm. called in the name that he always was going to call his little boy i'm not i'm specifically not saying his name Pe people who know me probably know who i'm talking about but he had a yeah, beautiful yeah. beautiful wife um she was a real, like it. mover and shaker and you know and... I, I just i think it's i think the dynamic is different if you're serving and you're in the marines say and you've got a family and you go on operations like say to afghan but if you've got like a really like lovely family and you've got kids, I don't know how people do it. And I'm not talking them down for whatever, whatever they want to do. But I just don't know how they do it. It's like because it's it's like legal. It's just child, not worth child it. Abuse. It's mental. I just I just don't know how they do it because it's just there's no amount of money that's worth it. And that's what I found in Afghan when I was doing CP in Afghan. I just got to a realization where I just thought. I'm not even bothered about how much I'm earning a month here anymore. I just, and I think when you get there, you have to leave mm. because I just, I kind of just were like, what am I doing? Like, it's just not worth it. Yeah. Uh, it's just not worth what I'm doing. Yeah. I get upset when I got people on the podcast or I chat, like I say, chat to a lot of people and they say, well, I, I'm an army brat or I'm in, and I say, stop saying that about yourself. And you can see how it's affected them, having to go mm. to all these new schools, not having daddy's, you know, daddy's not. It's not. Yeah. You know, every every it's, year every year of your childhood, your dad's there for three months. Yeah, know? it's not good, is it? It's 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 just it, there's no part of it that's it, it, let's that's, call it that's what advantageous. It, let, let, let's call it what it is. It it you know it it's um it's mental neglect. Mm. you know there, there's yeah it's tough it, it, you in social work there's categories of abuse and there's obviously physical sexual but mental is is an equal one and my mate used to cry himself he used after the falklands and his dad was the company commander down there for one of four twos um company commanders and my mate used to watch the news to see all they used to list the dead after the news right used to scroll up the screen all the people that had been killed in battle that day or the previous day and he's there what was i i was he would he was 11 years old watching the news to see if his dad was dead right Bloody and, hell. and then he used to take himself up in a bath and cry so no one could you know see that he was crying and um, it's not normal, is it? I mean, come on, it's not. No. That's, that's not normal. No. It's that. It's it's just no way to uh, no way to. Live. And you know what? That has a massive. Uh, that has a massive effect, negative effect on a on a maturing, young, susceptible mind, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, and like you said, all the turmoil and the the misplacement and. Uh, I'm sure you know, mate, but attachment is a is a massive, massive thing in psychology. Uh, uh, attachment theory, Mary Ainsco's attachment theory. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't, uh, if you don't achieve a secure attachment to at least one caregiver, you don't have to be a mum and dad or a caregiver. It has massive detrimental effects on when you get older and your success as an adult. Well, this uh, is where your so sociopath comes in, doesn't it? Someone who's never known love doesn't know how to give possibly doesn't yeah. know how to give love um yeah bowlby was the guy we used to study in social work. he talked about attachment theory with That's bowlby right. it was more to do with the infant the very young so you're a baby in a crib when you cry you're supposed to get picked up and that reassures you then that you you know but then you've got these babies, like, say, in a Romanian orphanage, you just cry, oh, there's no one there, you know. They're just, That's just, it. And this is the... That's it. This, this I, think is, this, I think there's, there's, five, there's five different attachments that can be drawn from 
certain kind of parenting as, a, parenting as a child. And just like you said, mate, if a baby gets picked up upon crying, it gives them the reassurance. And what happens is as they, as they get older, mm. they leave the safe base, which is the carer, and only to maybe play in a room. But then they look back and they come back. And that process of always going a step further, but knowing there's somebody there, just allows them when they get older to say, go travelling on a bigger, bigger, bigger scale and go out and explore the world and go down to London if you live up north to pursue work. Uh, because you kind of know that you've always got a safe base. Mm. Uh, it's, it's absolutely massive. And, and it's a massive uh, trick that us servicemen are missing, in, uh, especially in private when you, you're going out for months and months on end and, and leaving small children. It's, uh, it's detrimental. Yeah, I I just think children come first and adults, mm. sorry, you made your choices, but children come first and, um, yeah, but then again, you know, difficult one, isn't it? We're all human and we all make decisions and we think they're the right ones. At the oh, we quite often as servicemen, we just make the easy one, don't we? We do what we want to do, really. and It's a very, se- you're very selfish. You're very, very selfish uh, in your approach in a lot of ways. Mm. Yeah. To make, tell me about this uh, this hundred mile uh, adventure that you went on recently. I saw that on uh, on Instagram. You kept putting posts out. How did that come about? So, well, every year since two thousand and eighteen, I think I've been doing a big extreme endurance event every year so 2018 i ran an ultra marathon every day for 36 days the length of the uk carrying a 15 kilogram bergen and sleeping by the side of the road mate where Um, where does your rationale come from for that and your mindset what 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 prompts you to do that mate i wanted to get away from the family (laughs) <laughs> right <laughs> no um I, I i just love my life mate i love life and i i don't have any issue being on my own and i thought i'll, I'll have a little bimble down the country what well, aren't you know I've, I've i've got a lightweight sleeping i bought a lightweight sleeping bag at about 300 quid i bought a lightweight roll mat ultra light blow up roll mat 200 quid i bought a bloody ultra like 10 480 quid it's just insane right so i got all this kit thing it's all oh i got this ultra light wind shield for my cooker from china arrived the day i was going right ultra everything was ultra light and it still weighed 15 kilos to have the i did manage to get it down as i i, I as a matter of necessity i had to get that weight down um because so I broke my leg halfway down the country. I, I had a, a shin splint, so a fractured right leg. So um, that was interesting. Wow. That, that was interesting. That's um, that's where the rum came in, but that's another story again. So, <laughs> so I did that. I ran to La- John O'Groats to Land's End, and it was, yeah, it's a good old thing. Everyone should do it, you know. So, so you did 10 miles a day for 10 days. Is that how you did it? Uh, that one I I did uh, about thirty mile around thirty miles a day every day for thirty six days. Fucking hell! So yes. Yeah, so how, how did you? How did you fit? My goal was. How, just how, right. how, Sorry, how did on, you? Mate. How did you? How did you cope with that mentally? Because obviously, uh, you would have been massively fatigued physically. Mate, and then obviously I, that then goes into the mental aspect of it, it doesn't it? It gets worse than that. I was I'd been disabled for two years before it. I'd um I ruptured a disc in my back and I was bed bound for six months. Um I was in chronic agony, just dope, really doped up with mega, mega strong opiate drugs for 18 months and, and you know, then you've got to get off all that shit, which is just a nightmare again. Mm. Um, so mm. I, I got an operation to remove part of this disc in my back. And and off the back of that, 
And here's the thing. This is where it all gets a bit weird. Because I never get sick. I'm alkaline, so I can't get sick. Mm. But I did have this thing that they're talking about, right? So I can't kind of go down there. But uh, what all I'm trying to say is, if, you know, I have some serious questions. It's what people think it is. I think it, you know, my experience is I don't get coughs, colds, flu. I never get any of that stuff, right? You, when you're alkaline, mm. you, do, you don't you don't get that stuff, right? And that's why I do it. That's why I eat vegetables is I don't like being ill. Mm. But then I had that thing. And for six, for, for uh, four months, I couldn't stop coughing. And my son was doing it too. Right. And the time, the four months that I planned to train to run the length of the country, it, you know, they say don't train when you're ill, don't they? You know, you let your mm. body. So I didn't train. Rest. And then when it got to the, the time my flight was going up to John O'Groats, I still hadn't done any training, having not gone further than the car for two years. Um, so it's, it, but I went up there, mate. I went up there, alkaline, firing, you know, on good form. And I just wanted to show people you can do whatever you want if you put your mind to it. You just can't, you know. Mate, I completely, I, I, I absolutely agree, completely. That's just an unbelievable feat of, uh, it's unbelievable, unbelievable. But like, it's, it's all in the mind. It is all in the mind. Yeah, the last two days were, were hard. I was at a place called, um, I think it was Liscard, which is just over the border here in Corn into Cornwall. And I looked at the map and it was, 80 miles to Land's End, and this was Friday evening, right? Mm -hmm. And I was just pitching my tent. So it meant I had, to, having already run the length of the country with a broken leg, I had to run 80 miles in two days. Otherwise, I'd miss all the people that would gone gone down to clap me in, to Sunday obviously being a day off. Oh, my God. And I remember that morning standing on that highway at seven in the morning, staring down. There were no car. There was very few cars. I was literally stood in the highway, staring down the dual carriageway. And I thought, let's do this. And that was it. And uh, so I, I ran pretty much um, the best part of 80 miles in two days carrying his Bergen, having already done 34 ultra marathons. And that last day, mate, I was, because I couldn't stop, I had to get to Land's End or everyone would just go, go home and I'd let them all down. I, I, I just had to keep running and I was absolutely, absolutely spent. I couldn't speak. All I could do, <laughs> make, all I could do is make noises and point. I was the peak of people coming out. Come a couple of bootnecks came to run with me, and I'm hum, really, hum, hum, and they're like, <laughs> uh, water, "Water, he wants water." I'm, hum, hum. I get his berry out. Get his berry out. <laughs> it's like, um, yeah. Anyway, so I did. That was 2018. 2019. I came last in my first ever triathlon, Olympic triathlon. Come last. Come so late. My son's going. Where's my daddy? <laughs> right? They even tried to get me to to like pull out of it because I was so beat. So I decided that at that moment I'll do a quadruple Ironman in in eight weeks time. So having come last in a triathlon, I then went on to swim nine miles, cycle four fifty, and run a hundred and eight miles, all all in a week. Um, the next year. Uh, 2019. I'm missing out on something here, but I um. I, this last Christmas, I gave up my Christmas to run around a running track. I ran a hundred miles around a running track. What just a standard uh, athletics track? Yeah, 400 meters. Don't ever do it, folks. Boring as. <laughs> so, oh my god! I did hundred miles. What, what, what was that like? very hard i i was how, how how long did it take you that 
um, the 100 miles around a running track, right, which I thought I could do in like 24 hours, I really did, ended up taking me two and a half days. <laughs> and then when they shut the running track for Christmas Day, I, I went out onto Dartmoor and I ran another 100 miles through the worst oh storm in that God. we've had in recent history, right? Snap, I, I tore my calf muscle, all this sort of stuff. But ah, anyway, it was it wasn't you know. And then, well, how old um, were you when you? How old were you, Chris, when you joined the Marines? Sixteen. Eighteen. Eighteen. Yeah. I think there's a lot to be said for lads that join between like sixteen and eighteen, and when they're successful in the Marines, they just end up doing really mad shit like you. Yeah. The thing is, for me, it's not mad, though. It would be mad not to do it. Yeah, yeah, fair yeah. enough. Yeah, just a matter of perspective, yeah. And it's, um, I'll be honest, it might sound hard, but I'm actually taking the easy option, mm. right? So I learned to fly. I'm a, I've got a pilot's license for life. I say that because I did it in the US. So, you, so I'm a pilot for life now. I don't have to like requalify every year like you do in the UK. Um, was it hard? No, I just had to chuck three and a half grand at it. This is quite a while ago. And and commit to three and a half weeks of training in the States, right? It, you had to study, you had to, you know, it, it, they didn't, they don't give it to you. But it's not beyond impossible. So I did that. Mm. Uh, skydiving they gave me an aeroplane i flew up the coast and went skydiving for, for for two weeks got my skydiving license right that's pretty piss easy um and great fun the, the challenge is is i just always ask myself what's the worst that can happen well running the length of the country is maybe you get hurt and you have to hitch a lift to the to the nearest doctors or a hotel or something that's not Anyone can do that, right? That's that's mm -hmm. that's the worst thing that can happen, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's what I say. And for me, it it just makes life worth living, and it, it would be hard not to do, you know. So to answer your question, I was supposed to run across the desert last week, Marathon of the Sands, right? You run across the Sahara Desert in Morocco, and because I won't. Uh, have this uh, procedure, they they wouldn't let me on the plane. Mm. So um, my five grand is still uh, in limbo. Can you get that back or? Well, it might be that they have to give it back because no one's forcing me to do anything that I don't want to do. It's just never going to happen. Mm. As I keep saying to the veterans out there who are starting to wake up and pay attention, this isn't going away. This isn't like mm. if you do this thing, oh, it's all everything back to no. There is no normal now. This is an age old this is an agenda that's gone on for a long, long, long time. The people that are behind it are incredibly nasty, but they're also incredibly clever and incredibly smart. And so I don't know. I you know, this is why I'm saying people gotta start pulling their finger out because that means you're never allowed to travel ever again. That means you never let, you can never go and see your family in Australia. This means you never go on holiday again unless it's in, in, in the UK or you smuggle yourself out of the country. This means you never go in a, never can go in a nightclub ever again in your life. Right? This is what we're looking at. And this is what everyone's blindly just go not everyone, you know, there's many good people out there that are putting up a good fight. Um but this is what I say to veterans. Now is your time. This is why you swore an oath. Don't just roll over and shit on your children because it makes your life easier. It's, it's, um, ah, anyway, sorry, going off on one, Gareth. But the point is, I couldn't get on the plane. So I thought, right, what can I do in this country? And my friend, DJ Mark Wilkinson, he's also gives me, he's my life coach. Um, he was raising money for a little girl called Christina, who's recovering from a brain tumour and needs special, you know, treatment. 
So I said, look, why don't I run 100 miles down the coastal path, which is something I've always wanted to do, and I'll get, raise the money for this little girl. And um, we've just made £2,000. So thank you, amazing. everybody who supported me. It's amazing, mate. Yeah, and it was fun. It was nice. I, I took, I bought an ultra lightweight uh, bivy bag. Like it, it's actually called a special forces bivy bag. And uh, at night, you know, when I was a bit spent and I had me evening meal, ran into the rain. It was the weather was quite bad. I just got climbed in that and slept and carried on in the morning. But yeah, I'm surprised you're not up for this sort of stuff, Gareth. I mean, I'm getting there, mate. You know what? I really am. I'm. I'm getting. To... In the last couple of months, I think coming out of of, of, of lockdown and uh, and this COVID uh, carry on, I want to do something. I feel like I, I want a challenge, uh, and I'm ready to. I think challenge myself physically again and mentally, and just and just again put myself out of my comfort zone. I've, I've spent like nearly four or five years writing the book, so I just kind of just want to just get out there and. And just uh, just have a bit of a a bit of a refining of myself, really. Just just challenge, very much like yourself, mate. I think it, I think it's in us where we just want to every now and again. You wanna you wanna do something that's just really really tough, and just see where you are, and just have that spiritual experience. Yeah, what was good? I'll tell you, this was really beautiful. Was my old marine mates all come out to support me? My troop, you know, troop mates from training. Yeah, it's fantastic, mate. Yeah. And, I mean, one of them drove all the way from Birmingham, so to see me at Land's End. Uh, one of them chased me around Scotland trying to find me just so he could, like, buy me lunch or something, just to, you know, say well done. Um, another one, Steve, bless him, one of my best friends, just come out to get me, took me back to his farm, you know, lanced my blisters, massage my feet with cbd oil because my legs were so like swollen towards the end of it. like it was pretty messy and um i'm probably forgetting some people there as well but the thing is what steve said is like god chris you've just awoken the spirit in me that i had when i went to limpston and i forgot i forgot that we he come out right this is for friends at home. This is why, you know, this is why the Marines is so special. Is him and Mike Buster Keating, who subsequently run the country himself. They both put me up on my way down. And in the morning, they both lifted up that backpack, put it on, and both ran 40 miles non-stop with me. So, Someone asking about the tattoo. <laughs> yeah, whose face is it? So I'm just putting it out there. Any, any, uh, any guesses? Um, don't break my heart, my achy breaky. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> What's his name? The blue in Miley Cyrus. It's Billy Ray Cyrus. No, it's not that, mate. No. Is it? You're no. going to tell. You're going to say it's someone who's died now, aren't you? And, yeah, and, it is, mate. Yeah. yeah and I'm going to wish I wasn't. Any... Wish I wasn't making jokes. Frank Bell, exactly. Yeah. See if there's any more, uh, any more revelations on that. That's so, right, mate. Yeah, Dale uh, Ali. Yeah, absolutely correct. So sorry, who is it? I, I, I... Muhammad, Muhammad Ali. Oh. Yeah, you can, he's, you he's can said, see it better. It's... He come out with one of my favourite ever quotes. And he said, if a man believes the same thing at 40 as he did when he was 18, he's wasted his life. Mm. And mm. how often as veterans do we see that? I just I just loved him. I, I think as a person, he was just absolutely fantastic. It, it was his courage that I admired to go against the grain uh, and just and just say, you know what, I'm I am me and I'm I'm not I'm not gonna fight for something I don't believe in. And I think it's just incredibly powerful. And I just loved his his stance on on human rights and equality and I just think he's just I think he was just incredible so it's just something that I felt like I had to do really Gareth on that note I'm going to love you and leave you brother 
Um, I, I it's been a pleasure, mate. Oh, mate, we could chat all night. It's just great. And thank you for listening to me. And for everybody at home, you know, I, I talked as, <laughs> as much as Gareth, but this is why I, I like these chats. Hopefully people can get something from it. I'm saying I'm going to cut and run, mate, because I like to tell my boy a story before he goes off and I might just catch him while he's awake. Um, uh, massive thank you. Wish you all the best. In the book. I was just going to read a little bit now, but we'll have to do that next time. Yeah, next time, mate. Absolutely. Folks, yeah. there's a link below, so grab yourself a copy. Thank you again for my shirt, buddy. Mental. Pleasure, mate. Pleasure. Um, yeah. When I mate, thanks for inviting me on. I always enjoy chatting, mate. And oh. uh, yeah, absolutely fantastic. Mate, mate. let's just do it again soon, mate, because it's uh, wonderful. Thanks to everyone in the chat. Thank Cheers, you, everyone. Patty. Cheers, Thank buddy. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ben. Everybody, Frank, Andrew, Luke, for taking charge of everything. I'm going to play us out. Gareth, don't stay on the line because I'm literally going to run after this. Uh, I'll give you a phone tomorrow, brother, or something, yeah? All right, my mate. Well, have a nice evening, mate. I hope you catch your boy and a pleasure chatting again, eh? You too, brother. <laughs>